The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Next time you go to the theater to see a new play, ask the person sitting next to you who wrote it. Chances are he won't know. Oh, he'll know who's starring in it, and probably he'll know what the critics had to say about it. But it will take a furtive glance at his program before he can tell you the name of the playwright. Yet, weeks, months, and even years earlier, there was a playwright. Patiently, stubbornly putting words on paper. As the old theatrical saying goes, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. Nobody's going to believe this. I know. I, I don't believe it myself. And neither do I. But it happened, didn't it? mystery drama, The Imposter, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Don Scardino and Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by X-Lax and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. playwright loses hegemony over his work as soon as a producer buys his play. The producer hires actors, a director, a designer, a manager, and the playwright who started the whole thing becomes a pallid spectator to the feverish activity which begins both in the theater and in the producer's office. It is in just such an office that our story begins. If you don't believe what I'm about to tell you, don't blame me. I have trouble believing it myself. I'm Ted Harris. I'm assistant to the incredibly successful Broadway producer, Norman Gelb. Years ago, when I first went to work for him, I was sitting in my office right next to Norman's when I heard his voice raised to an unaccustomed pitch. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Mrs. Mahaffey, it can't be done. We open tonight. Your play opens tonight. Mrs. Mahaffey, there isn't a printer in town who could do it. I'm telling you that... Now, come on in, Ted. Mrs. Mahaffey, you have written a great play. It's going to be a big hit. Don't you understand? No, I can't do this one little thing for you. Because it's impossible, and it's crazy. What's up, Norman? Oh, come, come on in, sit down. I take it that was Mrs. Mahaffey yeah, on the phone. Our marvelous playwright, our genius... Our pain in the neck. What's it all about? Ted. Ted, you are not going to believe this. Mrs. Mahaffey acting up all of a sudden? Acting up? She's lost her marbles. She's such a nice lady. Mrs. K. Mahaffey, whom we all adore and revere. Mrs. K. Mahaffey, who has written the best play any producer ever got his grubby hands on. The best play since... since Norman, uh... Norman, just tell me. What does the lady want? Oh, Ted, you are not going to believe it. What is it? She wants. She wants her name taken off of the play. She what? I told you you wouldn't believe it. I don't. Ted, Ted, there has never been a production like this. I don't mean just the script, though Lord knows that's a masterpiece. But I have hired the best people, the best actors, the best director, the best designer, because I love this play. It's in my blood. It's part of me. Do you know that every day since I read it, I have gone around thanking whatever star looked out for Norman Gelb that this play came into my office. And you know how it got here? Mm, through the mail. No agent, no nothing. From a playwright nobody ever heard of. You know, I, I darn near didn't read it. Yeah, you had me read it. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I did, didn't I? And you liked it. I liked it a lot. And then, then I read it and liked it even better than you did. Couldn't wait to get on the phone and buy it. Do you remember that? I remember Naturally, Mrs. K. Mahaffey was very happy, very grateful. And who wouldn't be? 
Norman Gell was not one of your schlock producers. Ah, oh, far from it. When she came in, Ted, to sign the contracts, I thought, my, what a nice, reasonable lady. So normal, I thought. Very calm, very poised, very sweet, very nice. But I didn't take advantage of her. Mm-mm. Or the fact that this was her first time out. I gave her good terms because I knew that she had written a great play. Mm-hmm. Though I remember thinking at the time, how could such a great play come out of such a normal lady? <laughs> now it turns out she's not such a normal lady. You just never know about these things, do you? Mm-mm, never. Mm-hmm. You know that she's a uh, translator at the United Nations. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, she translates from German to English. Been doing it ever since her husband died about uh, ten years ago. Never wrote a thing in her life. Not even an article, let alone a play. Imagine. The most intricate, the most exacting form of literary composition there is. And she writes one. A good one. Good. It's a great one. Fantastic. Ted. Ted, do you know what I have done for this little lady? A lot. No, 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 no. This is something special. A surprise for tonight. I put her name up on the marquee. Ted, you know that's never been done for an unknown playwright. I want to show her how we believe in her, in her play. I want her to come to the theater tonight and look up at the marquee and see her name spelled out in lights. I want to see her face when she sees it. And now she wants new programs printed up without her name. Do you think it's first night nerves or what? I don't know what. Good Lord, Ted, we go up in in four hours. How can I get new programs printed up in four hours? You can't. Oh, Ted, she's hysterical. Do me a favor. Go up to her place and talk to her. Make her see it is impossible. Will you do that for me? Oh, I don't know, Norman. Please, Ted. What'll I say? You'll think of something. I hope so. Sure you will. She likes you. You'll think of something. What name does she want you to put on the programs, or, or do you just say by anonymous? She wants me to substitute another name. Any other name? No. She was very specific about the name. What was it? Um, uh, Vervain. Martin Vervain. All the way up to Mrs. Mahaffey's apartment building, I tried to think what I could possibly say to this nice, unassuming woman who had suddenly, seemingly, gone slightly mad. I didn't know her awfully well. Most of her contacts had been with Norman. But she and I had always gotten along. When I got to the apartment, I waited a moment and then pushed the button. It was at least a full minute before the door opened. And when it did, it wasn't Mrs. Mahaffey. It was a dumpy little woman I'd seen around the theater a few times. Yes. Uh, is is Mrs. Mahaffey in? Oh, what? I'm afraid she isn't seeing anyone right now. Oh, well, uh, maybe she'd see me. Mrs. I... Mahaffey's play is opening tonight on Broadway. Yeah, I know. I, I work for Mr. Gelb, the producer. I'm Ted Harris. Mr. Gelb asked me to come up here and talk to him. Oh. Well, in that case, come on in. Mm-hmm. She might see you if it's about the play. I'm Dorothy Dillingham. I'm a friend of Kay's. Actually, Kay wrote the play at my house. I have a little place up in the Catskills. Oh, is that so? Oh, yes. Well, we're very close, Kay and I. Both being widows. My husband and hers died the same year, within a few months of each other. I've done all I could. I can't do anymore. They won't listen to me. Nobody will listen. Nobody understands. I've tried. But no use. No use. That's Kay. She... But she sounds very upset. She's been upset ever since the road tour. Mr. Gelb says she wants her name taken off the program. She does. She's quite determined. But doesn't she know that that's impossible? Well, if she does, it doesn't make any difference. But we open tonight, Mrs. Dillingham. Less than four hours from now. I know. Mr. Gelb said she wanted another name substituted. Martin Vervain. You know about that? Oh, yes. Mrs. Dillingham, on the way over here, it occurred to me, does Mrs. Mahaffey think that a man's name would be better for some reason? Because if that's what she thinks, those days are past. It might have been true once. Uh, I guess it was. 
But these days, a woman's name is as good as a man's. Maybe better. I know. I know. Well, then, then why was she... Have you done it? Oh, Kay, dear. Uh, Mrs. Mahaffey... Have, have you done it? That's all I want to know, so that I can get some rest. Have you done it, Mr. Harris? Have you removed my name? Mrs. Mahaffey, we open in less than four hours. You can't get new programs printed up in less than four hours. There isn't a printer in New York that could do that. Well, have you tried? There's no sense in trying. It can't be done. Oh, what am I going to do? Mrs. Mahaffey, you've written a wonderful play. You should be proud. Oh, I'm ruined. I'm ruined. <laughs> Mr. Gelb has such faith in your play. He's even had your name put up in lights. Light? Light? Well, yes, on the marquee. You know, over the entrance to the theater. It was supposed to be a surprise for you. It's a very unusual honor. He, he thought you'd be so happy. Happy? Happy? I'll, I'll never be happy, happy again. Oh, how can you do this to me? D uh, uh, Mrs. Dillingham. Oh, I'm ruined. I'm ruined for life. Perhaps you'd better go, Mr. Harris. Uh, if, if, if you need me, I'll be at the office. Good. Because I think it's very likely I'm going to need you. Well, I bombed out. That was obvious. I'd gone there to try and pacify an hysterical woman, and if anything, I'd made things worse. Well, what did Norman expect from me? A miracle? I know you tried. She kept yelling, I'm ruined. Uh, I'll kill myself. She wouldn't do that, would she? At this point, I'm not prepared to say what she'd do or, or wouldn't do. She's one crazy lady. Well, crazy enough, the curtain goes up tonight, 8 o'clock sharp. Uh, who's that for Pete's sake? You want me to find out? I don't want to talk to anybody. Uh, Mr. Harris. Uh, Norm, it's, it's Mrs. Dillingham. Oh, is that Mr. Gale? Yes. How's Mrs. Mahaffey? Not too good. That's why I had to talk to you. I think there's something you should know. Uh, come in, Mrs. Dillingham. Mr. Gelb, I know Mrs. Mahaffey seems to be acting in a very... a very peculiar manner. You could say that. Yes, you could say that. Wanting the name Martin Vervain put on the program. It's crazy. Not completely. Because, you see, Martin Vervain did write the play. But you mean to stand there and tell me Mrs. Mahaffey did not write this play? She stole it? No. Plagiarized no, no. it? No. Then what did she do? Where did she get hold of it? Oh, please. Uh, Mrs. Dillingham, was Mr. Vervain a, a collaborator? You could call him that. Mr. Vervain and Mrs. Mahaffey worked on the play together? Yes. That's it. Oh, she never told me that. And now this Vervain wants to cut in on the royalties. He'll sue. No, no, Mr. Gell. Well, he can sue Mrs. Mahaffey, not me. I acted in complete good faith. My hands are clean. Mr. Vervain won't sue anybody, Mr. Gale. Mr. Vervain's been dead for 50 years. People tend to ask writers the oddest things. And the tritest. Where do you get your ideas? Do you write every day or just when you feel like it? Do you use a typewriter or put it down in longhand? Do you write in the morning or the afternoon or at night? As though by learning the mechanics, anyone could write. If you've ever tried it, you already know that nothing could be further from the truth. We'll return shortly with Act Two. Gelb, theatrical producer, and his assistant, Ted Harris, have been disturbed, to put it mildly, by the demands of their new and talented playwright, Kay Mahaffey, to remove her name from the programs and substitute the name of Martin Vervain. The demand seems pointless as well as impossible. The opening is to take place this very night. As our first act ended, Mrs. Mahaffey's friend, Dortha Dillingham, stood in the office of Mr. Gelb, and we heard... Was Mr. Vervain a collaborator? They worked on the play together? You could say that, yes. Oh, she never told me that. And now this Vervain wants to cut in on the royalties. He'll sue. 
Well, he can sue Mrs. Mahaffey, not me. My hands are clean. Mr. Fazane won't sue anybody, Mr. Gerald. Mr. Fazane's been dead for 50 years. Norman and I just sat there, looking stupid. I know this must sound strange to you. Strange? <laughs> you said strange. It uh, does sound a little strange. It would to anybody who doesn't understand automatism. Uh, automatism? Never heard of it. Well, you see, in the field of parapsychology in which I happen to be very well versed... Uh, Mrs. Dillingham, why don't you start at the beginning and, and tell us how Mrs. Mahaffey got mixed up with Mr. Vervain. How they happened to uh, get together and write this play. Yeah, start at the beginning... All right, I'll do that. Uh, please. Well, Kay Mahaffey and I are very good, very old friends. We went to school together. Her husband died. And my husband died the same year. I, I took a little house up in the Catskills, and Kay went on living in New York because she got a job at the United Nations. Mm, translating, we know that. Well, every Saturday almost, I'd come into New York, and we'd have lunch and go to a matinee, and this particular Saturday, over the luncheon table, you're not looking well, Kay, if you'll forgive my saying so. Oh, I haven't been sleeping well, that's the truth. Oh, my dear. Well, it's living alone. Even after all these years, I can't get used to it. William visits me every night. It's a great comfort. Oh, Dorsa, please, don't get started on that spiritualist stuff again. I know you don't believe in it. It's fantasy. It's pure fantasy. Call it anything you like. William does visit uh, Well, I simply can't go along with you on that. Although... Yes? What are you thinking? <laughs> the oddest thing happened at the U.N. yesterday. I wasn't going to tell you about it. I wasn't going to tell anybody because... It was so weird. What? What was it? Well, the man who does the French translating, uh, he started to cough. And for a few seconds, he controlled it well enough. But then I could sense that it was getting the better of him. And I... Yes? Yes. I jumped in and took over. In French? Yes. But you can't speak French. Oh, I told you it was weird. Of course, it was only for a sentence or two, but... They told me later I was perfectly accurate and my accent was quite good. Kay, you have gifts. Believe me, I've always thought so, but I didn't want to discuss it with you because you've always been such a goat. A what? A goat? That's what we call the skeptics. Goats. Believers like me are called sheep. Well, I think I'll stay with the goats. But my dear, your subconscious self has great power. Actually, everyone's has far greater power than the primary consciousness, the one we live with. Don't you see? When you jumped in for the French translator, your subconscious self took over. You hadn't been sleeping well. You told me so. You were over the border. I was what? Over the border. Your incarnate spirit was sufficiently over the border to receive but still able to control its own superliminal. You were able to receive from the French translator, but still able to say the words aloud. Oh, Dorothy, I, I don't know. It sounds like gibberish. Tell you what. After the matinee, come back with me to the Catskills. Stay overnight. You need the rest anyway. And we can talk some more. After the matinee... We drove up to my house together. I knew she was still very skeptical towards the whole thing, not to say hostile. So, on the way, I kept the conversation on very mundane subjects. Kay hardly said anything at all. I made her go and lie down while I fixed dinner. And after we'd finished eating, without any prompting from me, she said what you were saying at lunch about the power of the subconscious self? Yes. How do you... How do you get in touch with it? With the power? Well, there are different ways. I use a Ouija board. A Ouija board? I didn't know they still made those things. Oh, my dear. 
Everyone who's into parapsychology knows about Ouija boards. You have one? Of course I have one. You want to see it? I might look at it. I'll get it. It's right here. What you said at lunch about being over the border? Yes. I don't know if that's what I'm feeling right now. I have an idea. It's just the mountain air. How do you feel right now? Sort of uh, disconnected. Disassociated? I don't know what that means. It could be the beginning of a trance state. It's very odd. You know, I'm not sure I like it. Well, here's the Ouija board. I think my mother had one of those. It has the letters and numbers from one to ten, plus yes and no, and goodbye. Oh, it's such a funny name, Ouija. Well, it's a combination of the French and the German words for yes. We, oui, French. Ja, German. How strange. Okay, I know what you're thinking. What happened yesterday at the U.N., how you translated into French? When I only know German. Oh, let's start, shall we? Oh, this is all so exciting. Now, this little three-legged, heart-shaped thing is a planchette. We put our fingertips on it very lightly. Yes, that's right. And then we wait till it moves. We were there for hours to almost midnight. For the first hour... Nothing happened. Nothing at all. I was willing to give up. I thought Kay was too tired to continue. Perhaps we'd do better in the morning. But about ten o'clock, the planchette started to move. It spelled M-A-R. And then it stopped. Martin. Yes. But we didn't know that then. Well, what else did it spell out? Nothing. Just M A R. Over and over again for two solid hours. Then what happened? Well, a little after 11, Kay looked so exhausted, I insisted that she go to bed. We weren't getting anything new on the Ouija board. I said we could try again in the morning. So we each went to our own rooms and went to sleep. At least I did. But in the morning, when I went to make breakfast, there was Kay standing over the table staring at the Ouija board. Morning, bright eyes. Did you sleep well? I didn't sleep at all. Okay. Did you? Like a top? Never woke up once? Are you sure? Well, of course I'm sure. You didn't come into my room whistling? Of course not. Somebody did. Are you sure? You might have walked in your sleep. I never walk in my sleep, and I can't whistle. Dorothy, a little after midnight, just after I'd gotten into bed, I heard it, the whistling. It was an old tune, Indian love call. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember well, was that all? Just the whistling? I think so. Except I seem to hear someone scolding me. Someone very annoyed and irritable. Okay, let's use the Ouija board again. Right this minute. Maybe. Just Dorothy. maybe. Do you mind if I use it by myself? Why, no. I have this feeling someone is trying to reach me. If I could just be alone. Of course, I left her alone and went out to the kitchen. But a minute later, I heard it. Very faint, but unmistakable. Well, she could have been whistling it herself, couldn't she? Well, of course she could have been. Of course she could have. Well, let me tell you what happened next. I took a good long time fixing breakfast. I ate by myself in the kitchen so as not to disturb Kay in the living room. I cleaned up and putted around, and a couple of hours later, I looked up to see Kay standing in the doorway. Dorothy, I know who it is. Who, Kay? The M-A-R. You remember how those letters kept showing up on the Ouija board last night? Yes, just M-A-R. They are the first letters of the name Martin. Do you know a Martin? Well, this Martin is... 
Martin Vervain. And you know of Martin Vervain? Well, this Martin Vervain died 50 years ago. <gasps> okay. He was an actor. A very great actor. A star. It was his whistle I heard last night. And his voice. So it was very indistinct. Maybe he was reciting from one of the plays he starred in. No, no, I told you. He was scolding me. But why? Because it seems he has a play in mind. A play he wanted to write while he was a living actor. But he never had the time or the leisure to write it. But why should he scold you? Because he's been trying for years now to persuade me to write it for him. Only he could never get through to you. Something like that. Kay. Kay, are you going to? Are you going to write the play? I must. Don't you think so? Martin Vervain, after all these years, has gotten through to me. Dorsa, I can't let him down. That night, about midnight, I heard it. I heard the soft creaking of Kay's bed. Heard the door of her room open and close. Heard her go into the living room. Pull up a chair. And I knew. I was sure that through the Ouija board, she was receiving the words of the departed actor, Martin Vervain. Sure enough, in the morning, I went into the living room, and there was Kay, her face glowing though she had had no sleep for a day and a half. The first act finished, Dorothy. All night I worked. It went so fast I could hardly keep up, but the first act was complete. Oh, Dorothy, who would have thought that I... I... Why not you? Why should you not be an automatist? Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Victor Hugo received messages by automatic writing. Why not you? Oh, I never dreamed. It's no more than simple telepathy. The fusing of the incarnate with the excarnate spirit. Is that what's happening? Martin Vervain is the communicator. That's all an entity ever is. An entity, you say? An essence. A being from beyond. A sender. As you are a receiver. Oh, Georgia. Dorothy, that this should happen to me. Sunday night, at about midnight, I heard it again. And I heard Kay get up and go into the living room. But this time she didn't pull up a chair. Instead, I heard the soft tread of her feet up and down, up and down the room. And I heard, even though I could not make out the exact words... I could hear her voice, low, soft, all through the night, her voice declaiming. What was she doing? Why, she was composing the play, of course, as it came to her from Martin Vervain. A play does not get written that way. I know you are one of the goats, Mr. Gill. Oh, oh, what happened next, Mrs. Dillingham? Well, the next day was Monday, and Kay phoned the U.N. to tell them she wouldn't be in. That as a matter of fact, she'd have to take off the rest of the week. And every night, about midnight, I heard the whistle. And I'd hear Kay get up and go into the living room. But along about Thursday, I think it was, I didn't hear her voice as I had before. I heard instead, you'll never believe this. I heard a typewriter. Yes, a typewriter. Kay was taking down Martin Vervain's words on a typewriter. It's incredible. I told you you wouldn't believe me. You must admit, Mrs. Dillingham, it's not easy. Oh, no, of course it isn't. The part about the typewriter, I, I found that hard to believe myself. Though I had heard of such a thing a long time ago. Well, the next morning I confronted Kay with it. You don't mind my using your typewriter, do you? Of course not, but... Did you... Was it really? Was I really typing the play? Yes, of course I was. It sounded so easy. You went so fast. Oh, Dorothy, there's nothing to it. You know what I've decided? I've decided I'm the entity. Oh, no, Kay. Martin Vervain is the entity. You are the automatist. That may have been true in the beginning, 
But then I went ahead on my own. This is my place. I've even thought of the title. The Color of Desire. Do you like it? Yes, but I, I was just typing up the title page. The Color of Desire by K. Mahaffey. There. Tell me, John Matthias, someone is supposed to have said to the man who came to be known as St. John of the Cross, tell me, how do you write your beautiful canticles? To which the poet priest, they say, replied, sometimes God helps me, and sometimes I do it by myself. If the great saint received help from the deity, why should not Kay Mahaffey get help from a deceased actor named Martin Vervain? No reason at all that I can see. We'll continue shortly with Act Three. In our second act, we heard from the lips of Dortha Dillingham the account of how her friend Kay Mahaffey came to write a play. How, after a session with the Ouija board, a discarnate spirit who in his incarnate existence had been an actor named Martin Vervain, made himself known to Mrs. Mahaffey and conveyed to her telepathically a play he had wanted to write himself during his lifetime. As the act ended, we heard Mrs. Mahaffey say, Dorsa, I am the entity. Kay, Martin Vervain is the entity. You are the automatist. That may have been true at first, and then I went ahead on my own. This is my play. I've even given it a title. The Color of Desire. I was just typing the title page. The Color of Desire by K. Mahaffey. There. The next morning, we got out the yellow pages and we looked up theatrical producers. And we tore the page out of the phone book and glued it to the Ouija board and moved the planchette over it. And the planchette stopped at the name Norman Gelb. And we gathered up all the pages and put them in a folder and sent them to you. That is incredible. I know it's hard for you to believe. It's impossible. Mrs. Dillingham, uh, when Mrs. Mahaffey came in here to discuss the production... And all during rehearsals and all the time out of town on tour, she seemed all right. She wasn't, you know, the way she is now. I know. But she wrote me, I think it was from Philadelphia, that Martin Vervain was starting to give her trouble. Uh Uh-huh. What kind of trouble? She didn't say exactly, but she did say he was using bad language and and threatening her. You mean physically? I think so. Uh, Mrs. Dillingham... Mrs. Mahaffey has been under a great strain. I should say she has. No, no, no. I mean for a long time. Maybe ever since her husband died. You know, living alone, earning a living, all that. And then she writes this wonderful play. It just comes to her. These things do happen that way sometimes. And it's bought and cast and put into rehearsal and produced and tried out. That's all a lot of excitement and involvement. Even if you've been through it before, it's a big strain. And uh, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if Mrs. Mahaffey sort of, uh, you know, broken down a little. Her nerves have gotten the best of her. That's all it is. I'll get it. Norman Gelb's office. Let me speak to Mrs. Dillingham. I know she's there. Uh, sure. It's, it's for you. I think it's Mrs. Mahaffey. Oh. Kay? Oh, dear. Oh, that's awful. Oh, Kay. Yes, of course I will. Right away, dear. I have to go. He's with her and behaving badly. Oh, sure, sure. You run along. We'll see you at the opening. I'm not sure Kay will be able to come to the opening, Mr. Gelb. Not coming to the opening of her own play? Who ever heard of such a thing? This is going to be a night to remember. Well, Norman and I will remember it, that's for sure. He and I stood up in the back of the theater all through the performance. The play had never gone better. Everything went like clockwork. The actors were magnificent. And when the curtain came down on the third act... Oh, wow. Wow. Terrific. Oh, 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 oh. Don 
shame she's not here. Oh, yeah. Finally, they stopped applauding. Finally, they emptied the theater. Norm and I sat in the green room, happy and exhausted. Only one thing remained, the notices. What would the critics say about the play? It didn't seem possible they wouldn't rave about it. But one thing is sure about the theater. You can never be sure. What do you think, Ted? Oh, a smash. Oh, yeah. Oh, can't miss. Yeah. Still, critics are funny people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, what do you say we go across the street? Okay. Uh, where's your coat? Just across the street? I don't need it. Okay, let's go. You know, Ted, it's a funny thing about the theater. One minute it's full of life. Sound, lights, people. The performance ends, the applause stops, the people leave, and it's silent as death and as dark. <laughs> Look, even the lights on the marquee are going out. Okay, let's cross the street. Oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute, Ted. What's the matter? You know, I can't stand the idea of Mrs. Mahaffey not being with us when the notices start to come in. I don't want to sit there with just you and my mother. Go on up to Kay's apartment and see if you can't talk her into joining us. Well, why don't you come with me? She'll listen to you better than to me. My mother's over there waiting for us. You go, huh? Okay. Tell her we just have to have her with us, huh, Ted? Tell her it's the big night for all of us. Well... I got a taxi and drove to Kay's place. When the door opened and it wasn't Kay Mahaffey, it was Dorothy Dillingham. And she looked worried. Come in, Mr. Harris. Isn't Mrs. Mahaffey here? She's in the bedroom, but don't go in there. She won't recognize you. Is she sick? Not exactly. The doctor left just before you got here. He says she's all right. She'll come out of it. Come out of what? Well... The doctor said it's a sleep of exhaustion, but I know better. What do you think it is? I think it's deep trance. Oh, no. Mrs. Dillingham... It started at 8 o'clock. I was in here, and she was in the bedroom. I heard her cry out, Don't! Don't! Please don't! Mr. Harris, I'm sure he was with her. You mean... Martin Vervain... After a while, I went in there, and she was lying on the bed, perfectly quiet. I spoke to her, but she didn't answer me. That's when I called the doctor. I was worried. Well, of course you were. The doctor said he found bruise marks on her body. Oh? You know how I think they got there? Now, Mrs. Dillingham... I know. You're not a believer. No, I'm sure there's a simple explanation for the bruises. That's what the doctor said. But I know better. Mrs. Dillingham, Mr. Gelb and I were very disappointed that neither of you came to the opening. Oh, did it go well? Oh, very well. Very, very well. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Uh, Mr. Harris there? Oh, yes, just a second. For you. Uh, thanks. Hello? Ted, the notices are starting to come in. Radio, TV, Ted, they are sensational, fantastic, out of this world. Oh, well. Tell Mrs. Mahaffey she's got to come down here. Uh, how is she, by the way? Well, I, I haven't seen her yet. Oh, well, tell her this is something she can't miss. Once in a lifetime thing, unforgettable. Marvelous, Norm. I, I'll, I'll do my best here. Don't take no for an answer. I'll see you and make it so. Yeah, yeah. See you soon, Norm. That was Mr. Gelb. Yes, and he says... Oh, yes, dear. It was Mr. Norman Gelb. Oh, Mr. Gelb? Uh, Mrs. Mahaffey, Mr. Gelb was calling from a restaurant across the street from the theater... The theater where your play opened tonight. Oh, yes. The play. Mrs. Mahaffey, the reviews are starting to come in. Radio, television. Mrs. Mahaffey, they're all great. Oh, I wrote the play. Just as Mr. Vervain told me to. I never corrected or changed a thing. Mrs. Mahaffey, Mr. Gelb wants the three of us to join him. He does? Yes, and, and when you walk in, probably everybody will applaud. For me? Oh, of course for you. How will they know who I am? Well, your picture's been in the papers, and you'll be with me. Okay, let's go. Well... I'll, I'll get your coat. They'll really applaud? Sure. And we'll sit with Mr. Gelb, and people will stop by the table and congratulate you and tell you how much they liked your play. Oh, it does sound like fun. Oh, it is fun, Mrs. Mahaffey. It's fun like no other fun in the world. <laughs> 
Here's your coat, Kay. I've got mine. Ladies, shall we go? In the taxi, I didn't say much. I was secretly pleased with myself. For once, I had succeeded with Mrs. Mahaffey. And I looked forward to watching her take in all the glories, all the splendor of the theatrical world, which too often is grubby and depressing. But tonight, she'd see it with its best foot forward, and she would be thrilled. So far as I know, there's no bigger thrill to be had than the one that comes from a play that's a smash hit. I hope I'm doing the right thing. Of course you are. You just wait and see, Mrs. Mahaffey. It'll be the experience of your life. Will it? You bet it will. (gasps) Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris, are you whistling? Me? No. Are you? No, I can't. I knew I shouldn't have come. Uh, uh, Driver, driver. Yeah? Uh, Were you whistling just now? Why should I be whistling? Is the radio on? You want the radio on? No, no. Here you are. Come on, Mrs. Dillingham. I heard it. I know I did. Didn't you? Yes, yes. Come on, Mrs. Oh, I, I, I shouldn't have come. Oh, yes, you should. Look. Look across the street. What is it, Kay? Look up there. The lights. The marquee. It's lighting up. The lights are going on, one by one. The color of desire by Martin Surveyn. Ted Harris told you at the very start. He said you wouldn't believe it, didn't he? And you don't, do you? I don't blame you. It's a completely incredible story. Do I believe it? Well, I am rather like the White Queen in Alice in Wonderland. I have trained myself to believe three incredible things before breakfast. Once you get the hang of it, it's easy. Try it. You'll discover that half the things you find incredible turn out to be true. Incredible, isn't it? Mrs. K. Mahaffey never wrote another play. The Color of Desire ran for three and a half years. Did Martin Vervain desert her? Or did she desert Martin Vervain? There have been several playwrights who have written one successful play and were never able to do it again. Perhaps K. Mahaffey was one of these. Or should I say Martin Vervain was one? I leave it up to you. Believe whatever you like. Whatever you believe may very well turn out to be true. Our cast included Norman Rose, Don Scardino, Bryna Rayburn, and Ann Petoniak. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by General Electric Citizen Band Radios. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. <laughs>